Welcome everyone to this webinar, Recommendations of the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, NACI, on the use of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. My name is Aleksandra Wierzbowski and I am a project manager at the National Collaborating Center for Infectious Diseases. I will be your moderator today. NCCID is funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada to provide knowledge and evidence for use in public health planning and policy. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that NCCID is located on the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. There are a few housekeeping items I would like to bring to your attention. We are running this webinar through Zoom. For those having challenges with Zoom, we are also live streaming this presentation on YouTube. You can find the link in the email you received from Eventbrite yesterday or today for new registrants. If you have technical problems with Zoom or with accessing the live stream, please email us at nccid at umanitoba.ca. We will do our best to assist you. Today's webinar is to inform healthcare and vaccine providers on the NACI recommendations on the use of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. Following the presentation, there will be a short Q&A session. Please use the Q&A tab in Zoom to pose questions to our speakers, to our speaker. Please note, we cannot answer all the questions, but we will do our best. Lastly, the event is live and is being recorded. The recording of the presentation slides will be available on the NCCID website after the webinar. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Shelley Dix. Dr. Shelley Dix is the Chief Health Protection Officer at the Public Health Ontario and the Executive Lead for the COVID-19 Public Health Response at the Public Health Ontario. She is an Associate Professor at the Dalla Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto and is the Vice Chair of Canada's National Advisory Committee on Immunization, NACI. With over 20 years of experience as a public health physician, Dr. Dix has worked at all levels of the public health system in Canada and at the national level in Australia. She holds fellowships in public health in both Canada and Australia. I welcome Dr. Dix uh, to take the microphone. And good morning, everybody, and th thank you, Alexandra. If you can put up the slide deck, please. Thank you very much. Okay, as Alexandra indicated, I'm going to be speaking to you today about the recommendations of NACI, the Canada's National Advisory Committee on Immunization, on the use of Moderna COVID-19 vaccines. These recommendations were released on December 23rd. If you go to the next slide, I don't have any declarations of interest to declare other than I'm a very strong vaccine believer. Go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the objectives of today's presentation are to describe the characteristics of Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine platform, to summarize the clinical evidence for Moderna COVID-19 vaccine as we know so far, to summarize our NACI recommendations on the use of the vaccine, and to summarize key information on handling and administrating the, the vaccine. We can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so Moderna COVID-19 vaccine was authorized on December 23rd by Health Canada for use in the country for individuals 18 years of age and older. I will be talking about NACI's recommendations on the use of um, Moderna vaccine, but also Pfizer vaccine. Um, they're both mRNA vaccines and the recommendations apply to both vaccines um, and, and no other vaccines because these are the only two vaccines currently available in Canada. 
uh, up-to-date recommendations on the use of the, of the vaccines in full detail and supporting evidence can be found on the NACI statement. The link is, is there on the screen. Um, we are revising the NACI statements as vaccines get authorized. So we initially did uh, the Pfizer vaccine statement and now the, the new release from December 23rd has information on both uh, Moderna and, uh, and Pfizer. Can we go to the next slide, please. Okay, so what is NACI? So NACI is an external advisory body to the Public Health Agency of Canada, and we develop um, evidence-based advice on vaccines approved for use in Canada. We have been around a very long time. We have celebrated our 50th anniversary a few years ago, and we're actually one of the oldest advisory committees in the world. NACI is comprised of experts in the field of pediatrics, infectious disease, immunology, pharmacy, nursing, epidemiology, pharmacoeconomics, social science, and of course, public health. Our advice is published in the form of NACI statements that are typically summarized in the uh, Canadian Immunization Guide. Um, but also posted on individually on fax websites. So given the speed at which the COVID vaccine um, are being approved for use, the, the NACI recommendations on the use of COVID-19 vaccines are evergreen. They're not in the guide, but they are on the Public Health Agency of Canada's uh, website. And the link for more information on NACI is at the end of the screen. If we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so I'm first gonna start with um, the characteristics of the vaccine, and then I will go into the recommendations. So the next slide um, is entitled, What is Mo Moderna's COVID-19 Vaccine? It, similar to Pfizer, is a messenger RNA vaccine. A lipid nano, nanoparticles are used to deliver the messenger RNA directly into the cell. So it goes into the cells, not into the nucleus of the cell. mRNA coding for spike protein, that's the antigen, gets translated and, um, and uh, it is a new technology. This is the second vaccine that has been that has used this technology, of course, the first being uh, a Pfizer, the Pfizer product. Um, the, both vaccines elicit antibodies and T cell response. Um, the benefit, one of the benefits for these vaccines is that it is a very fast manufacturing timeline. Um, and as I said, Pfizer uh, also uses an mRNA vaccine. So what the little schematic on your right shows is that the, um, the mRNA is embedded within the lipid, the lipid nanoparticle. It enters into the cell and then there is um, the, the cell reads the message basically and develops the protein, um, which is the antigen that then um, then goes to the end to the uh, cell membrane and elicits the uh, the immune response. Next slide, please. So, how does the vaccine work? So, vaccine antigen, and I've already spoken a bit about this. Vaccine antigen is uh, mRNA encoded for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Um, so, the mRNA is very unstable. Um, the mRNA lipid particle is made of uh, two parts. In the, in the center is the mRNA and surrounding it is the lipid. The lipid allows the mRNA to enter into the cell and the spike gene to be translated into protein, which, is the, which acts as the antigen. Lipids don't mix well with water, so the mRNA lipid nanoparticle has uh, vaccines have special storage and handling requirements. And that's why um, we say there should be no vigorous shaking of the, of the product. If we go to the next slide, please. 
This slide shows a comparison of the Moderna and the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines. So you can see the similarities as well as the, the differences. So both are messenger RNA vaccine and they use the same technology. They, um, while Pfizer was authorized in Canada, at the, basically the second week of December, um, Moderna was authorized December 23rd. The age that they're authorized for is slightly different. So Pfizer is authorized for people 16 years of age and older, whereas Moderna is authorized for individuals 18 years of age and older. The dosing is also different. Uh, and I, this is a really important difference to be aware of in that um, there's two differences here. One is that Pfizer requires addition of a diluent, whereas Moderna doesn't. The dose of, of Pfizer is 0.3 mils, which is a little bit unusual for our typical vaccines whereas the Moderna vaccine is 0.5 mils, which is a more typical um, dose level that we deliver. The schedules are also slightly different. So both are a two dose series um, with the Pfizer vaccine being two doses given 21 days apart was the recommended interval in the trials versus Moderna two doses given um, uh, 28 days apart. Now, what we've done in the NASI statement is identified minimum intervals. So the minimal interval for Pfizer is 19 days, whereas the minimal interval for um, Moderna is 21 days. And our um, recommended interval for both is 28 days, so four weeks apart. Both are delivered intramuscularly. Both have the same nature of the antigen, so they both have our uh, perfusion spike protein. Um, neither of the vaccines have an adjuvant and they are both delivered in multi-dose vials, although the size of the multi-dose vial differs. So the Pfizer product is five doses in the multi-dose vial and the Moderna product is 10 doses. Both of them are preservative free. Go to the next slide. And the next slide. Okay, so now I'm gonna be talking about some of the the clinical trial evidence. And before I do, it's, it's important to recognize that these trials are ongoing. So both of these products have received interim authorization, but the, that does not mean that the trials have ceased. And importantly, we at, the, at, the, at, at NASI will continue to follow the evidence as it emerges. Um, and we will update the statements as more evidence emerge. So we've had pivotal phase one, two, and three trials being conducted for Moderna. Um, we have evidence on efficacy, immunogenicity, and safety is available for adults 18 years of age, uh, of age and older. And of course, this was required for, um, for Health Canada to um, authorize the, the vaccine. It's important to note that the studies didn't include participants from long-term care facilities. I will also tell you at, when we get to the slides, um, other participants who were excluded from the studies. The phase three portion of the trial involved 30,413 study participants randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive either two doses of the vaccine or a placebo. Trial data available to date are for an interim analysis. So as I said, the studies are ongoing. Therefore, the time of follow-up is not consistent, but was for a median of two months after the second dose. And the maximum follow-up for, um, for the data, uh, for the trial data that uh, we've reviewed at NASI was 14 weeks as of November 25th for all participants. So that's why we continue to say that we have short-term information only. 
Um, it's important at this time to just note that although right now we only know um, the, the results of the trials at um, to uh, maximum follow-up of a little over three months, those trials are ongoing and we will, as time evolves, we will get further information about medium-term follow-up and long-term follow-up. And the trials are always going to be ahead of the population who are being immunized because um, they are they are, they started um, um, months ago. So we will always be a few steps ahead in our recommendations prior to the population being at those time points. We go to the next slide. So here is some other important exclusions. I mentioned long-term care was in where uh, people in long-term care were excluded from the trials. Um, other exclusions were people, women who were pregnant or breastfeeding were excluded. Anyone with an immunodeficient or, or um, immunosuppressed condition were excluded. This did not um, include excluding people with stable HIV. So rather than stating that as a double negative, I'll say that people with stable HIV were included in the study. Anyone with a known history of SARS-CoV-2 infection were excluded. Anyone with a known or suspected allergy or history of anaphylaxis, urticaria, or other significant adverse reactions to the vaccine or its excipients were excluded. Those who have contraindications to intramuscular injections or anyone with a receipt of blood product, of blood or plasmid products or immunoglobulin three months before it vaccine administration were excluded. Importantly, people with chronic conditions were not excluded from the study. If we go to the next slide. So now I'm going to uh, summarize some of the evidence. So in the clinical trials, the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine was efficacious against symptomatic confirmed COVID-19 over the short term. And I've always, I've already explained to you why we're, we're emphasizing over the short term, and that's just simply because of the duration of follow-up um, to date in the studies. So what the, um, what the studies show is that there was 185 confirmed COVID-19 cases in the placebo, placebo group at least 14 days after the second dose, compared to over 11 in the vaccine group. The vaccine efficacy estimates are in the next slide. For those who only received one dose, there were 39 confirmed COVID cases in the placebo group that occurred at least 14 days after dose one compared to seven in the vaccine group. Uh, the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine was efficacious against severe COVID-19 in the short term. Um, there were 30 confirmed severe COVID-19 cases in the placebo group, group at least 14 days after dose two compared to zero cases in the vaccine group. We go to the next slide. <laughs> so these uh, are the vaccine efficacy estimates with the 95% confidence intervals. Um, and you can, I'm sure you all agree with me, they're very high. So in terms of um, preventing confirmed cases of COVID starting 14 days after dose two among people without prior evidence of SARS-CoV-2 at, at uh, baseline, the vaccine efficacy was 94%. Among participants who had received at least one dose, regardless of prior COVID-2 uh, COVID infection, the vaccine efficacy was 93%. And um, then, and that was um, confirmed cases of COVID-19 starting 14 days after the, um, after dose two. I want to just pause here to just flag that that says at least one dose. So it doesn't say only one dose. So most of these participants had gone on to receive two doses. In terms of confirmed cases of COVID-19 starting 14 days after, after dose one, 
um, and among participants without prior evidence of COVID uh, to infection at baseline, the vaccine e efficacy was 95.2%. And in terms of preventing severe confirmed cases of COVID-19 starting two weeks after dose two, among participants without prior evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection, the vaccine e efficacy was 100%. Was 100 the um, confidence interval was non-evaluable because there was no severe cases in the vaccinated arm. If we go to the next slide. So there's currently insufficient evidence on the duration of protection um, and on the efficacy of COVID-19 vaccine in preventing hospitalization and preventing death. Although I did, um, share with you the vaccine efficacy in severe, severe infection, would it, which would include people that died. There's currently insufficient evidence on preventing asymptomatic infection, although there is um, 14 participants in the vaccine arm who were previously sero, sero negative before dose one, who had um, asymptomatic infection at uh, the second time point versus, which was after dose one, versus 38 participants in the placebo arm. The, the company hasn't done any formal efficacy data as yet. And of course, these, uh, that analysis is ongoing. And there's currently insufficient evidence on whether the vaccine reduces transmission of SARS-CoV-2. So we fully expect that over time, we will, have, um, we will have evidence about a number of these endpoints. However, it's just too early to say now. If we go to the next slide. In terms of safety, so safety evidence was based on the interim analysis as well of uh, 30,350 participants with a medium follow-up of 49 days after dose two um, and 78 days after dose one. So I know a number of people were interested about the long-term follow-up for safety um, and just stating here, similar to vaccine efficacy, the, the current um, duration of follow-up is relatively short. Um, so less than two months after dose two for um, for safety. Um, no serious safety concerns have been identified to date in the clinical trials. Um, however, studies are, are ongoing. There have been seven serious adverse events in vaccine recipients that were considered to be related to the trial inter in intervention, including two cases of autoimmune disease, which were reported. Um, um, among among um, recip vaccine recipients who had hypothyroidism. Uh, and there were five, five serious adverse events that occurred in placebo, uh, placebo recipients. In terms of the seven SAEs in or serious adverse events in vaccine recipients, there was one case of intractable nausea and vomiting, one, two cases of facial swelling, um, one case of B-cell lymphocytic lymphoma, one dyspnea with exertion and peripheral edema, and then the two cases of autoimmune disease that I mentioned was one case of rheumatoid arthritis and one case of autonomic dysfunction. We go to the next slide. Similar to Pfizer, some adverse events were very common particularly after the second dose. So events tended to be more common after the second and the first dose. Um, and they were reported to affect more than 10% of people who received the vaccine. However, most of these were mild or moderate and transient in nature. So I indicated that there were more common in people receiving the second dose than the first. They were also more common in younger recipients compared to those over 65 years of age. Some of the common adverse events included pain at the injection site, fatigue, headache, muscle, pain, muscle pains, joint pains, axillary swelling and tenderness, chills, nausea and vomiting. 
Participants who inadvertently received the vaccine um, while pregnant are um, currently being followed. So I mentioned that pregnant women were excluded from the study, but there were, tw there were uh, 13 um, women who became pregnant during the study and they are, con they are still being followed um, as we speak. And at the time that we saw the analysis, there were no pregnancy outcomes among the vaccinated individuals as yet. We go to the next slide. <laughs> so now into the NACI recommendations. Next slide, please. Okay, the following recommendations apply to both available COVID-19 vaccines unless specified. And as I've said, I think three times, both are mRNA vaccines. The next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of vaccine administration, both um, vaccines are administered intramuscularly in a two-dose schedule. And um, I have previously explained the differences. So here you can see once again that the volume, the dose volume for Moderna is 0.5 mils versus 0.3 mils for Pfizer. And the um, min minimal interval for Moderna is 21 days with the authorized interval being 28 days. Um, and for Pfizer, the minimal interval is 19 days. Um, however, providers can use either 21 or 28 days. The same vaccine product should be used to complete the vaccine series. So if, um, if an individual is um, immunized with Moderna, they should complete the series with Moderna um, and vice versa for, for the Pfizer product. If administration of the second dose of vaccine is delayed, the second dose should be administered as soon as possible. There currently are no data on maximal intervals between doses or as I said previously, any data on medium or long-term efficacy of either vaccine. The, we know that the peak humoral response in, occurs um, about a week after the second dose. Um, and, there, um, and, and we postulate that long lasting immunity may not be activated without a second dose. So um, we're seeing a prime boosting phenomena. If we go to the next slide. Importantly, serologic testing does not need to be conducted before or after receipt of a COVID-19 vaccine to assess, to assess susceptibility to, um, to either the disease or immune response in the recipients. COVID-19 vaccines should not be given simultaneously with other vaccines, either live or inactivated at this time, unless such vaccines are required for post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, COVID vaccines should also not be given simultaneously with um, monoclonal antibodies or convalescent plasma. We go to the next slide. In terms of contraindications, the um, COVID-19 vaccines are contraindicated in individuals with a history of anaphylaxis after a previous uh, administered sorry, after previous administration of the vaccine. Individuals with a history of severe allergic reaction to a component of COVID-19 vaccine should not receive the vaccine. So polyethylene glycol is a potential allergen in both products. So it's in Moderna as well as Pfizer um, and has been known to cause type one hypersensitivity reactions. In situations of suspected hypersensitivity or non-anaphylactic allergies to COVID-19 vaccine components, investigation is indicated, which may lead to immunization in a controlled setting. Consultation with an allergy, allergist is advised. If there is a special concern about a possible allergy to a component of COVID-19 vaccine being administered, as uh, an extended period of observation post-vaccination to 30 minutes may be uh, warranted. We go to the next slide. 
In terms of precautions, in individuals with bleeding disorder, the condition should be optimally managed prior to immunizing to minimize the risk of bleeding. Individuals receiving long-term anticoagulation are not considered to be at higher risk of bleeding complications following immunization and may be safely immunized without discontinuation of their anticoagulation therapy. As a precautionary measure, and in light of the need to be able to monitor for COVID-19 vaccine adverse events without potential confounding from symptoms of COVID-19 or other coexisting illnesses, it would be prudent to wait until all symptoms of an acute illness are completely resolved before vaccinating with an authorized COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. Vaccination of individuals who may be currently infected with SARS-CoV-2 is not known to have a detrimental effect on the illness. However, vaccination should be deferred in symptomatic individuals with confirmed or suspected SARS-CoV-2 infection or those with respiratory symptoms in order to avoid att attributing any complications resulting from infection with SARS-CoV-2 to vaccine-related adverse events following immunization and to minimize the risk of COVID-19 transmission at the immunization clinic or venue. If any persons are identified with symptoms at arrival at the immunization clinic or venue, they should be instructed to follow current local public health measures. Next slide, please. In terms of post-vaccination counseling, NACI recommends that prophylactic oral analgesics or antipyretics, for example, acetaminophen or ibuprofen should not be routinely used before or at the time of vaccination, but their use is not contraindicated to vaccination. There currently is no evidence on the benefit from administration of oral analgesics oral analgesics for the prevention of immunization injection pain or systemic reactions. Oral analgesics or antipyretics may be considered for the management of adverse events if um, a vaccine recipient gets pain or fever if they occur after vaccination. Next slide, please. Okay, so now to the NACI recommendations. So NACI recommends that a complete vaccine series, so that is a two-dose series of, of COVID-19 vaccine should be offered to individuals in the authorized age group without contraindications to the vaccine. In the context of limited vaccine supply, initial doses of COVID-19 vaccine should be prioritized for the key populations outlined in our guidance on the prioritization of initial doses. The rationale for this recommendation is that available COVID-19 vaccines are highly efficacious in the short term against disease, and there are no significant safety concerns. COVID, vac COVID vaccines are authorized in, in individuals 18 years of age and older for Moderna, 16 years of age and older for Pfizer, uh, based on the pivotal clinical trials conducted in these age groups. Medium and long-term follow-up are underway and needed and will be done. And NACI will continue following the evidence and update the recommendations as we get more information. If we go to the next slide, please. In terms of public health measures, NACI recommends that all individuals should continue to practice recommended public health measures for prevention and control of SARS-CoV-2 infection and transmission regardless of vaccination with COVID-19 at this time. As I've mentioned, there's insufficient evidence on the duration of protection of the vaccine and the effectiveness of the vaccines in preventing asymptomatic infection and reducing transmission of SARS-CoV-2, which is why we've made this recommendation. Although there is preliminary descriptive ed evidence suggesting Moderna may reduce asymptomatic infection, but the evidence is insufficient at this time to recommend discontinuing of uh, public health measures. Um, and there's no evidence on the use of COVID-19 for a post-exposure prophylaxis. prophylaxis. Next slide, please. Among persons with previous infections, NACI recommends that a complete series with uh, COVID-19 vaccine, vac COVID vaccine may be offered to individuals in the authorized age group without contraindication 
um, who have previously, who have had previous uh, COVID-19. In the context of, of limited vaccine supply, initial doses may be prioritized for those who have not had a previous, P previously PCR confirmed infection. The rationale is there's a lack of evidence in this group, but the level of protection from previous uh, infection is unknown. As I said, we don't recommend testing for infection prior to receipt of vaccine. Vaccination may be delayed for three months following a PCR confirmed infection as reinfections reported to date have been rare within the first three months following the first infections. And of course, as I've said, all symptoms of an acute illness should be completely resolved before vaccinating. Next slide, please. In terms of the immunosuppressed populations, NACI recommends that COVID-19 vaccines should not be routinely offered. And that's a little bit different than our previous recommendation. So what we're saying is it should not be routinely offered to individuals who are immunosuppressed due to disease or treatment until further evidence is available. However, a complete series with a COVID-19 vaccine may be offered to individuals in the authorized age group in this population if a risk assessment deems that the benefit outweigh the potential risk for the individual and if informed consent includes a discussion about the absence of evidence of use of COVID-19 vaccine in this population. The rationale for this recommendation is that immunosuppressed individuals were excluded from trials, so we have absolutely no evidence of efficacy and safety in this group. However, no safety signals of concern have been noted to date in non-immunosuppressed participants with an immunocompromising condition included in the clinical trials, um, which is why we have emphasized that clinicians need to do a risk assessment um, prior to determining whether to vaccinate their patients. People living with HIV were included in the trials and, are con and uh, those that are immunocompetent may be vaccinated. If we go to the next slide, it's about autoimmune disease. NASTY recommends that COVID-19 vaccines should not be offered routinely to individuals with, with autoimmune conditions until further evidence is available. However, um, a complete series of COVID-19 vaccines may be offered to individuals in the authorized age groups in these populations if a risk assessment deems that the benefits of the potential risk for the individual um, outweigh, sorry, the potential risks, and if an informed consent discussion about the insufficiency of evidence on the use of COVID vaccine has occurred. So um, as I had indicated, there's very limited data on COVID-19 vaccination in, in individuals who have an autoimmune condition. Um, the spectrum of autoimmune conditions is diverse and the balance of benefits and risks must be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Previous mRNA vaccine technologies may have elicited inflammation and theoretically exacerbated existing autoimmune diseases, um, which is why they, we have framed the recommendation such um, in a precautionary, precautionary way. Um, current applications of mRNA technology for COVID vaccines have been op optimized to reduce this risk. However, further evaluation is needed. And again, we are following the, um, the, the study and data, and we will revise this uh, recommendation as further information is available. We go to the next slide. It's about pregnancy and breastfeeding. And similar to the others, it's word, we've worded this that COVID vaccine uh, should not routinely be offered to individuals who are pregnant until after completion of pregnancy, until further information is available. However, a complete series with a COVID-19 vaccine may be offered to pregnant individuals in the authorized age group if a risk assessment deems that the benefit outweighs the potential risk for, for the individual and the fetus, and if informed consent includes a discussion about the absence of evidence on the use of COVID-19 vaccine in this population. If we go to the next on breast, breastfeeding, the wording is, uh, oh, sorry, for, for breastfeeding, the wording is, is similar to um, pregnancy. 
The rationale for this is that anyone who was known to be pregnant or breastfeeding at the time of vaccination were excluded from the trials. Um, there is a lack of evidence on efficacy and safety in this group, as only a few individuals actually became pregnant in, during the trial. They, this occurred both with Pfizer and Moderna, and those women are currently being followed. There's currently no evidence to guide the time interval between the completion of COVID-19 vaccine series and conception. In the face of scientific uncertainty, what we've said is it would be prudent to delay pregnancy by 28 days or more after the administration of, complete, of the complete two-dose vaccine series of an mRNA vaccine. Um, and we've also noted that an mRNA vaccine may be administered anytime after pregnancy, taking into consideration whether an individual is breastfeeding. Individuals who become pregnant during vaccine series or shortly thereafter should not be vaccinated, uh, sorry, should not be counseled to terminate the pregnancy based on having received the mRNA vaccine. We go to the next slide. For children and adolescents, uh, we recommend that COVID-19 vaccines should not be offered to individuals who are not in the authorized age group, recognizing that Pfizer's um, indication is slightly lower to 16 versus Moderna's at 18. However, a complete series with Pfizer may be offered to individuals 12 to 15 years of age who are at very high risk of severe outcomes of COVID-19, for example, due to a pre-existing pre medical condition known to be associated with increased risk of hospitalization or mortality, and who are at increased risk of exposure due to living, for example, in a congregate care facility. If a risk assessment deems that the benefit outweighs the potential risk for the individual, and if informed consent with the individual and the parent or guardian, includes discussion about the insufficiency of evidence on the use of vaccine in this population. There is very limited data on safety and efficacy of the Pfizer vaccine in individuals 12 to 15 years of age, and there is no evidence in Moderna. And again, further evidence will, um, will be available as these trials progress. We go to the next slide. Okay, the, the next um, part of the uh, presentation is on handling and administering the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. And I am delivering this on behalf of the logistics team of the Public Health Agency of Canada. If we go to the next slide. So storage and handling. The storage is for um, Moderna is different than Pfizer. So storage is at minus 25 to minus 15 degrees Celsius until expiry. It can be stored at two to eight degrees for up to 30 days, but should not be refrozen and should not be stored on dry ice. When transporting to another site, Frozen transport is recommended. However, limited transport in the liquid state at refrigerated temperatures, so that is between two and eight degrees Celsius, is possible with special attention to temperature control and limiting jostling of the products. Again, do not store on dry ice and it's essential that temperatures are, are monitored. So this vaccine has, um, has uh, more easier, can I say, storage conditions than the Pfizer product. We go to the next slide. In terms of thawing, um, when you thaw from freezer to room temperature, it requires about one hour to thaw and can remain at room temperature for 12 hours, but importantly, only six hours after the vial has been punctured. If you're thawing in the refrigerator, it requires uh, two and a half hours to thaw it can stay in the refrigerator for up to 30 days, and it needs to be kept at room temperature for at least 15 minutes before administering the vaccine. And of course, we're, it, it cannot be refrozen. Um, all product must be used within six hours of first puncturing the vial. And remember there's 10 doses in the vial. Um, indicate that the appropriate dates and time on the vial so that the expiry point is clear. So it's very important to ensure pro proper um, marking on the vial to indicate the start time and the end date. 
but need to be clear which, it, which time is which, particularly the puncture time. We go to the next slide. In terms of drying up, um, it, the product should be checked for foreign particulates or discoloration. It should be a white to off-white suspension. It may contain white or translucent product-related particulates. Use a alcohol-based hand rub, rub, sorry, gently swirl the vial, do not vigorously shape it. Swab the vial stopper with the alcohol wipe, let it dry. Ensure the needle is tightly attached to the syringe by giving it an extra turn using asymptom, sorry, aseptic techniques and a new needle and syringe, draw the dose, which is 0.5 mils. Mark the date and time of first, first puncture on the vial. And as I've said, I think multiple times, it must be used within six hours of, um, of first puncture. And then this process is repeated until the vial is um, used. And, um, and as I said, 10 doses are, um, are available in each file. The manufacturer has indicated that the product is stable in the syringe for up to six hours. So it must be used within six hours of the first time the vial is punctured. If preloading, only draw up enough to keep the clinic running smoothly and use as soon as possible. Next slide. In terms of administering the vaccine, once again, use an alcohol-based hand rub. Check the syringe to ensure no particulates or discoloration and that it's the correct dose of 0.5 mils. Prepare the skin, give the 0.5 mils dose IM in the deltoid, discard the needle and syringe immediately um, into the sharps container and use an alcohol-based hand rub. And then of course, the client should return one month later for the second dose. And importantly, we don't recommend to restart the series if there is a delay in return. Next slide. This is the landmarking slide. We can go to the next slide. And this is a, a comparison of the two products. And um, we've seen this in the past, so I don't want to spend much time on this, but just flagging the storage conditions, which are, are um, different in terms of Moderna um, being requiring regular freezer conditions and Pfizer requiring the minus 80 to minus 60 um, storage. Next slide, please. Ah, and that's it. This slide just shows the NASI members and our liaison representatives and the ex officio representatives. We go to the next slide. It, this slide indicates the high consequence infectious disease working group, which is basically the COVID vaccine working group members. And I think that is it. We can go to the next slide where there is additional resources. And now we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you, Dr. Deeks. Uh, so now we're going to begin the Q&A session of this webinar. So once again, for all of you who would like to pose a question for Dr. Deeks, please use the Q&A tab in your Zoom uh, window. And please note that we will try to get to as many questions as possible, but we cannot address them all today. So I would like to start off with a question that has been uh, mentioned by a lot of the attendees. Uh, and Dr. Deeks has already addressed this in great length, but could you please talk more about what is recommended and what is known about the use of the Moderna vaccine in the immunocompromised population, those with immune, autoimmune disorders and those on immunosuppressive therapy? Could you define what conditions and who falls into the immunocompromised groups uh, for which the vaccine is contraindicated? Yes, as I mentioned, there is very limited information on immunosuppressed conditions um, because they, uh, those participants were not included in the trials. NASI in the Canadian Immunization Guides defines, um, defines immunocompromising conditions um, and we're recommending that people use that, those definitions. So it's um, 
conditions that cause immunosuppression, but it is also it also includes medications that cause immunosuppression. Um, although there is limited data now, we fully expect that data will emerge as populations are vaccinating. And um, we will, as soon as we have enough information to modify this recommendation, we will, uh, we will be making, uh, making changes to the recommendations uh, for both, for all basically, for both the pregnancy, um, autoimmune disease and immunosuppressive suppressive conditions. So what, so, you know, I, I know people um, are very anxious to, to know more, but unfortunately there is very limited data available, which is why we say we, you really need to do a risk assessment, looking at the individual's condition, but also the epidemiology of the outbreak at the time of vaccinating um, and, and how that individual is um, interacting in their, in their community. So a risk assessment needs to be done to take all into account. Okay, thank you. You spoke in great length as well uh, about the differences between Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. Could you elaborate on the difference in the dose between the two uh, vaccines that are currently available and why is there a difference in those? Why is one larger? Uh, what are your thoughts about that and what has been known about this? Well, one is, I, I can't specifically say it's not unusual to have, have products have different dosing. So that is just the way the product was manufactured. So I don't think that there is any um, reason for concern that they are different doses. One is uh, 0.3, one is 0.5. The reason that I recommended or that I stressed it so much during my talk really is that um, people need to be aware of the different doses and not, um, not immunize with 0.5 of the Pfizer product or 0.3 of the, of the Moderna product um, because then you won't be getting an appropriate dose. Okay, thank you. Can you speak to the efficacy of the vaccine, of the Moderna vaccine with just one dose? Yeah, so I gave you the information about one dose efficacy. Um, but the way that the trial, if there, the way that the trial were con was conducted was that the vast majority of people went on to receive a second dose. So um, the efficacy for one or more doses was over 90%. But we don't know the vaccine efficacy nor the duration of protection for people that only received a, a single dose. Um, and that is important because um, as I mentioned, when I talked about the immune response, the, um, what, we, what we saw with the immunogenicity data is that an, there was an immune response after one dose, a, a very strong immune response after one dose. After two doses, there was um, a boosted response um, with the peak in, um, in um, levels at about two weeks after the uh, second dose, and then a gradual decline to uh, 90 days after the second dose, which was as long as has been followed. So what we, why we're saying a two dose series is, um, is considered um, a complete series is because the, the, um, the majority of participants have received two doses, have been followed and are continually, continue to be followed for that duration of time. We just don't have enough information as yet to know whether one dose will be enough in the long, in the long term to maintain protection. And of course, we're in this 
for a long haul. We're coming into the end of the first year of COVID-19 um, and we need to ensure that people have a robust and long lasting immune response. Okay, thank you. To follow up on this, a question that came in, uh, is one dose of Moderna vaccine being considered and when might that be decided? Could you comment on this? No, I think I've just commented on the one dose issue. Okay, thank you. Could you describe the difference between the COVID-19 messenger RNA technology compared to the traditional vaccines? Yeah, so in terms of the traditional vaccine, the antigen um, tends to be injected into, um, as part of the immunizing the individual. So whether it's a protein, whether it's a the whole virus, um, like an attenuated or weakened strain of the virus, um, for, for example, for measles, mumps, and rubella, um, or it's a virus-like particle for HPV, the antigen is injected and the host, or in this case human, makes, um, makes an, um, an immune response to that antigen. For the mRNA technology, the um, mRNA is kind of the messenger and the, it goes into the host cell and it, it's actually the host or us that makes the antigen that then causes the, ourselves to um, mount an immune response. Okay, thank you. Can you talk more about what is recommended and what is known about the use of Moderna vaccine in patients with allergies, specifically food allergies, uh, latex allergies or other drug allergies? Sure. So in terms of allergies, as, um, as, as I indicated, people with allergies to components of the, of the vaccine were excluded from the clinical trial. Um, not a lot is known um, in terms of, of um, allergies, other allergies, and they are not contraindicated to receive the vaccine. However, what we have said is that if, if clinicians or immunizers are concerned that they have um, an individual who is um, atopic, that they should um, extend the um, period of observation to 30 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Can you talk about recommendations regarding vaccination in the long-term care facilities? Should all residents, regardless of whether they had COVID-19 infection, receive uh, or not receive the COVID-19 vaccine? Yeah, so what, that's, a, that's an excellent question. In terms of um, vulnerable populations, and I think we all agree that, that people in long-term care are a very vulnerable population, as long as they don't have a contraindication, they should receive the vaccine. Um, and, I, and I did mention in the talk that people that have had a previous history of COVID-19 can receive the vaccine. Um, what we're saying though, is that um, typically you, um, you could wait about three months. However, we recognize that logistically that may not be possible. Um, and it would be fine to vaccinate people that have had a past history of COVID-19. Okay, thank you. Can you talk about um, your, the evidence for the Moderna vaccine to stop transmission of COVID-19 from one person to another, to reduce hospitalizations, to decrease maybe the severity of the disease? Yeah, well, I have done that, but the in terms of the... There is no evidence at this, this time that the vaccine will reduce transmission. We just don't know as yet. We, I'm very confident that we will know. Um, however, we just don't have that information 
um, now. I think it's important for people to, to recognize that it is not unusual as a vac vaccine is first licensed to not know, um, for there to be gaps in knowledge. We typically don't know if how what the duration of protection for a vaccine is. And for, for neither Moderna nor Pfizer do we know the duration of protection. Typically though, we would know longer than um, like two or, three, two or three months. Um, but, uh, but because of the way these vaccines have been authorized, um, we at this point only know about short term protection. In terms of severity, I did present the data on um, vaccine efficacy against severity. Um, and it was the VE was a uh, hundred percent and in we had there was no cases of um, severe outcome in the um, in the uh, vaccine recipients. The the data are not in yet for hospitalization, um, but I suspect that you know as the trial length continues, we will have um, evidence about other uh, outcomes that are just not available as yet. Okay, thank you. Can you talk more about what is known about the safety of the Moderna vaccine? Can you talk mo uh, more about the side effects? And can you maybe also talk about how can healthcare providers reassure their patients regarding their concerns about long-term consequences of, of uh, COVID-19 vaccines? Sure, this will have to be the last question because I know that we're over time um, and I actually have, have another meeting I need to get to. Uh, in terms of short, in terms of safety, that is well detailed in the NASI statement. So um, I would um, recommend that your listeners actually go to the NASI statement to get the, to get the full amount of information that is available. Um, briefly though, there, as I indicated in the presentation, there are, there, there were a number of local and systemic adverse events that were relatively common at about 10%, which included um, local pain in the injection site, redness in the injection site, some swelling and tenderness in the, um, of the lymph nodes around the injection, uh, fever, uh, muscle aches, pain, those were all uh, relatively common in the um, in vaccine recipients. There was um, seven serious adverse events, which I think I went over quite in detail in the in the um, talk, and those were considered to be related to the intervention by the investigators. Um, that is not unusual for a, um, for a clinical trial. Um, and so importantly, the, the manufacturer is continually following the um, trial participants for, I believe, up to two years. Um, as I said in the presentation, the, the recipients at the time of license had only been followed for two months. So um, those people will continue to be followed. In addition, as the vaccine is, is rolled out globally, we have a pharma, we're part of a global network for pharmacovigilance. And um, we will be monitoring at the provincial, territorial, national level, uh, adverse events that are being um, reported in other countries, as well as adverse events that are being reported in Canada. The same is gonna be true with respect to um, vaccine effectiveness. As you know, we'll get further information from the clinical trials as they progress, but we're also gonna be benefit from vaccine effectiveness studies from countries, including Canada, as the vaccine is rolled out. So we will know more about how effective this vaccine is in multiple populations, including immunosuppressed and pregnant women, 
um, and how safe it is. Okay, thank you so much. So unfortunately, uh, we I appreciate we appreciate everyone's questions uh, coming in, but we will not be able to get to any more questions as Dr. Dix has to go, and we are past time. So I thank Dr. Dix for presenting today, and I thank all of you for joining. I would like to point out that NCCID will be hosting more COVID nineteen vaccine uh, webinars. Um, please check our website nccid.ca for more information. We will also be promoting on social media. Today at 3 p.m. Eastern time, we will be hosting this same webinar in French and registration is still open for those of you who might be interested. So before I conclude, I would like to ask that you fill out our short evaluation when you leave the webinar. These surveys are important to our future planning. Thank you and stay safe. <laughs>